When talking about the evolution of professional wrestling during the mid-90s, Eric Bischoff's name should always be mentioned in the conversation. From working his way from the very bottom of WCW all the way to the top, Eric not only changed the World Championship Wrestling into a profitable company, but he also changed the very face of professional wrestling itself. When Bischoff presented the world with a viable alternative to the WWF during the 90s on Monday nights, he forced Vince McMahon and the WWF to alter their content to become more contemporary. Without Eric Bischoff's work in WCW, who knows where the modern WWE would be today. This video takes a look at Eric Bischoff and his rise within WCW. Eric Aaron Bischoff was born on May 27, 1955 in Detroit, Michigan. When he was 14 years old, his father moved the family to Pittsburgh and two years after that, the family moved again to Minneapolis. He joined the school's wrestling team, where he may not have been the best amateur wrestler, but he kept coming back for more and never gave up. He did, however, excel in karate. Eric Bischoff wanted to make a career out of karate, but quickly realised there was no money to be made in the sport. It was, however, during his early karate days that he became friends with Sonny Ono. Eric got work at a food processing company as a salesman, where he was the youngest salesperson on the team. He had a knack for the job and he made a good bit of money in pushing and promoting products to the public and to vendors. He also began modelling on the side, making extra money when he wasn't in sales. Sonny Ono had developed his own tag game for children. The game was called Ninja Star Wars and with the sales experience of Eric Bischoff, the pair managed to get Ninja Star Wars advertised on TV screens and sold in stores. Eric traces his whole career back to the Ninja Star Wars game, as around this time, he reached out to Vern Gagne to see if he could advertise Ninja Star Wars during AWA TV shows. Eric felt that the game's younger demographic would be tuning into the AWA after school, so it made sense to push this game on Vern's wrestling show. This was how Eric got into pro wrestling. The Ninja Star Wars toy was advertised on AWA and because the AWA was in the middle of a downturn, Eric Bischoff was able to hang around and learn the production side of television. He was able to jump from division to division, learning the game at a quick pace as Vern was understaffed at the time. Soon enough, Eric Bischoff became a credited production assistant in the AWA. One day, the AWA were due to record interviews with the wrestlers, but the interviewer didn't show up. Eric just happened to be in the office with his suit on. Eric was asked to do the interviews and from here, Eric then became a host and a backstage interviewer for the AWA. He was a little rough around the edges at first, but after time, he became better. Eric stayed loyal to Vern and the AWA, even when things weren't going well with the company. He continued to work in the AWA when he wasn't even getting a paycheck, but during this time he did audition for the WWF, but he didn't get the job. Bischoff eventually got a job in WCW as a very low TV host, initially working alongside Diamond Dallas Page. In Eric's words, he was made to do all the assignments that Tony Schiavone and Jim Ross didn't want to do, but he was also there to put pressure on Schiavone and Ross, being that guy in the background who was forcing the commentary A-team to improve on their skills. WCW was losing millions of dollars and Ted Turner sent Bill Shaw, a Turner president, into WCW to see what could be salvaged. Shaw felt the company could do with a proper executive producer. This was, after all, a TV show and Shaw felt that an executive producer could steer the ship in a better direction. Eric, on the brink of leaving WCW at the time, applied for the position and he got the job. Lowly Eric Bischoff, the backup announcer who'd done the assignments nobody wanted to, was now the boss. Bischoff immediately made changes to WCW's talent travel arrangements to cut costs and also done away with touring house shows. The expenses, he felt, were too great for shows that weren't drawing any people. 
he made a smart choice in moving WCW's television tapings to the Disney MGM Studios, now known as Disney Hollywood Studios. Not only did this cut costs where logistics are concerned, but it gave WCW a much needed presentation makeover. The move to Disney also meant that WCW would always have a crowd for their TV shows. No more empty arenas, it all helped with branding, it brought in new advertisers, it was a smart move and it worked. Fast forward to 1994, Hulk Hogan was also at the Disney MGM Studios in Florida, making his TV show Thunder in Paradise. Ric Flair has been credited as the one who set up a meeting between Eric Bischoff and Hulk Hogan. The two were able to make a deal, a very lucrative deal at that, and when all was said and done, Eric Bischoff was able to sign one of the most recognisable wrestlers in the world. Hulk Hogan made his WCW debut in July of 1994, a move that certainly had the WWF watching from a distance. Going into 1995, Eric Bischoff, now on somewhat of a roll and close to turning WCW into a profitable company, had a meeting with Ted Turner. Ted, not pulling any punches, asked Eric what needs to be done for WCW to be competitive with the WWF. Eric was not prepared for this question, but he also didn't want to give a bullshit answer and look foolish. Raw was on Monday nights, WCW's main show was on a Saturday night, so Eric said that WCW needs a prime time TV slot during the week. Ted Turner gave Eric Bischoff two hours on TNT every Monday night. WCW Nitro and WWF Raw were about to go head to head and Eric felt he may have been just a little over his head. This was a big opportunity but it was a scary thought. Eric sat and worked out a list of everything the WWF was at the time. Vince McMahon's company was targeting a younger audience, they had taped shows and their characters were cartoony and over the top. Eric knew that he couldn't do what the WWF was already doing at the time, he'd get his ass kicked if he did, so he decided to be the total opposite of what the WWF was. He would target the young male demographic, he would have live shows, his characters would be reality based instead of cartoony and over the top. All of these ingredients created Nitro and Eric to this day says that these differences is what made Nitro stand out. The first episode aired on September 4th, 1995 from the Mall of America in Minneapolis. By the end of 1995, WCW finally turned a profit, so the hiring of Eric Bischoff as executive producer had literally paid off. Seeing as there's been like three DVD box sets released based on the best moments of Nitro and the Monday Night Wars has had its own WWE Network series and a few books written about it, it would be crazy of me to start going into the ins and outs of the Monday Night Battles between WCW and the WWF. The NWO should be mentioned though, as I feel this was Eric Bischoff's greatest idea in wrestling. Yes, the angle was done before in Japan, and Eric drew inspiration from the UWFI invasion of New Japan Pro Wrestling, but it's not like this kind of invasion angle was done before, to this amount of success, on American soil. More so, Eric Bischoff had the idea to make the NWO as reality based as possible, something that Vince McMahon couldn't have ever dreamed of doing in the WWF in 1996. Having the NWO be a sort of separate entity to WCW was an incredibly effective idea and adding Hulk Hogan to the mix brought it to a whole new level. As WCW and the NWO grew in popularity, Eric Bischoff led the company in defeating Raw in the TV ratings for 83 consecutive weeks. Of course, not all of Eric's viewer gaining tactics were ethical either. For example, he would give away the results of Raw before the WWF even put the show on the air. But hey, all's fair in love and war I guess. But yeah, it was a shitty move. Eric was also not afraid to address his competition directly, even going as far as to challenge Vince McMahon to a fight at WCW Slamboree in 1998. 
On April 13, 1998, the WWF ended WCW's run on top of the ratings war. While WCW was still profitable and posting some high numbers for pay-per-view buys and TV ratings, the WWF were on fire with the Attitude Era and their focus on new talent. Eric Bischoff had been given contracts to practically anyone who had previously worked in the WWF, which the fans quickly grew tired of. This, along with some questionable booking decisions, made fans turn over to Raw as war. Again, I don't want to dig too much into the Monday Night Wars and there's plenty here for future videos, but all we need to know is that by the end of 1999, the decision was made to relieve Bischoff of power. What we shouldn't do though, is look at this like it's a case of the WWE always coming out on top. Quite the contrary. Eric Bischoff's aggressive booking style had forced the WWF to improve their own product. If anything, WCW done an incredible job of showing how complacent the World Wrestling Federation had become. There's no doubt that the WWF was putting on some good shows. I for one loved what the WWF was doing in 1997, but the numbers here don't lie. Eric Bischoff had created a product that took down a titan. Fans, at one point, wanted to watch what Eric Bischoff was presenting much more than what Vince McMahon was presenting. And that is a great achievement in itself, especially when Vince had held a monopoly on wrestling for so long. Yes, the NWO was made up of old WWF wrestlers, but WCW at one point also had an incredible undercard that many argue was even more exciting than its main roster. This was a very important element I feel in the success of WCW and also an important element that those who challenge Vince nowadays really need to consider. Like him or not, Eric Bischoff deserves a ton of credit for putting his ideas in motion. Sure, some of the hirings were questionable and some of Eric's strategies lacked ethics, but it worked really well. And you best believe if Vince McMahon had the same ideas along with the same bank account, he would have done the exact same thing. Anyway, eventually, Vince Russo was brought in as the supposed saviour of WCW, and this didn't turn out too well. Bischoff soon returned as an on-screen character, who also had the job of helping Russo write TV shows behind the scenes. This didn't work out too well either, and the last time we saw Bischoff in WCW was at Bash at the Beach 2000. WCW was put up for sale, and Eric Bischoff made an offer that was, in fact, accepted. Bischoff had been in touch with investors and he had been given the green light to make an offer. However, the new head of Turner Broadcasting, Jimmy Kellner, decided that there should be no wrestling at all on Turner Networks and WCW programming was totally cancelled. With no network or a place to air WCW shows, Eric said that WCW was worth around 50 bucks. Bischoff was relying on still having a TV channel ready to air WCW and without this, he felt he had no use for the company. In the end, the WWF purchased WCW's assets, including the tape library, trademarks and a few contracts. This wouldn't be the last time we would see Eric Bischoff though, far from it. The wrestling world was shook when Eric Bischoff made an appearance in the WWE, his rival for so many years and the company he wanted to put out of business. Eric Bischoff had some real career highlights in world wrestling entertainment, but we will save that for another day.